After two highly exciting Road to Le Mans races during Le Mans week last month, we return to the more bread and butter type uh, racing in the Michelin Le Mans Cup with a two hour race ahead of us later on today. That starts just before four o'clock local time here at Spa Francorchamps. But before that, we need to, of course, determine the grid around this classic Grand Prix circuit with two doses of qualifying, first of all for the GT3s and then for the LMP3s. The championship really starting to hot up after a great week uh, for Tony Wells and Colin Noble. They arrive here in Belgium as the LMP3 championship leaders, but only by nine points. My name's Johnny Palmer, joined by the editor of dailysportscar.com, Graham Goodwin. And, uh, well, I mean, you were at Le Mans calling the Road to Le Mans event uh, itself. That midweek race, which actually was away from the cameras, you needed to be paying attention to that because it was all about safety car and the timing of the safety car. It absolutely was, Johnny. Good afternoon, everybody. A uh, cracking couple of races at the Road to Le Mans, as we've got used to in these recent years. A firm part now of the package for the Le Mans 24 hours support. And yet, yeah, the, again, the Michelin Le Mans Cup uh, runners and some guest cars uh, did nothing other than entertain, uh, kept people because it was great to have fans back there, as mm -hmm. we have back here, Johnny, uh, albeit in fairly limited numbers today, but uh, in glorious conditions at Spa, but fans back at Le Mans, and uh, certainly no short of a shortage of entertainment on tap for them uh, around the fantastic uh, Le Mans circuit. And here we are at another fantastic circuit, the just uh, smidge over seven kilometres long spa Francorchamps circuit. It's had its challenges, of course, this season, with uh, all sorts of weather-related dramas, but I've rarely seen it looking better than it does today. Uh, clear skies, beautiful sunshine. Just been standing outside and watching the Ligia European Series race while you've been calling that, JP. And mm. it's a lovely day and it looks to me like it, that this weather is going to attract rather more fans as the weekend draws on. Well, that's the exciting thing, isn't it? Because for the first time, the doors are finally open for the European Le Mans series and the spectator banks uh, echoing to the signs of fans hooping and hollering because uh, the action already has come thick and fast for the Ligier European series. And now we turn our attention then to the feeder class, effectively into the European Le Mans series. But there's also this massive prize uh, for the GT runners that if they win the title, that's an automatic entry into next year's 24 hours of Le Mans and yesterday new calendar announced not only for the ELMS but for the Michelin Le Mans Cup as well and certainly for the Le Mans Cup brand new venue to visit uh, two brand new venues uh, to visit so well uh, well certainly in the LMP3 era back to Imola uh, that was the venue one of the venues for the very first year when it was GT3 only for the Michelin then GT3 Le Mans Cup uh, and then the Hungara ring in July it will be a scorcher there <laughs> I'm absolutely certain of it uh, so it's an interesting calendar should mention as well by the way with the Ligier European Series uh, uh, just having taken place with their race one that they'll be joining the Le Mans um, support package in 2022 which is fantastic news for them and I'm sure that will draw more and more interest to the first rung on the ladder for the ELMS package. Really does hang together as a, as a great three grid circus if you like around Europe. Six very good venues for what I think are going to be six fantastic race meetings with the Le Mans Cup missing out on the Barcelona ELMS round uh, to accommodate of course the road to Le Mans where they will be once again as part, a key part of the support package for the Le Mans 24 hours in 2022. Yeah, so you've got um, the chance to enter effectively the 24 hours of Le Mans a, a number of years prior to it. So, you know, conceivably, you could enter as part of the Ligier European Series. That could be the precursor to the road to Le Mans and then into the big show after that. And it also caters for the big, the all important thing, which is budget. Because, you know, teams that arrive that have never run at Le Mans before may not have a great deal of that, but want to drum up interest. And you look at teams that have slowly built their position at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, like TF Sport, who were one of the early winners in this championship, who have slowly grown that. Um, Egidio Perfetti, who was at that very first GT3 Le Mans Cup event at Imola that you spoke about, he's never been short on budget, but he has been short on, on experience back those years. Started to ply his trade in this particular class for GT3s, and now look at him, a regular in the World Endurance Championship. 
it's a longer circuit than normal for the Michelin Le Mans Cup, Johnny, and that, of course, means, uh, as always, we get a slightly longer uh, qualifying session. Uh, there are rather slim pickings, it should be said, for the GTs here, with a couple of teams having suffered quite major damage uh, around those Le Mans races. It is just a magnificent trio of GT cars. Two Iron Lynx cars, including this, the Iron Dame, Dame's efforts. They are our top three in the championship. So it will be the two Iron Lynx Ferraris and the number two Porsche we saw just leaving uh, pit lane. So we can be looking for where the pace comes here and increasingly where these three high quality GT3 cars can finish in the overall order in the two hour race later today. Yeah. Um you, you can understand why these three cars have entered this event because they are riding high in the championship as far as the teams are concerned and are so desperate for the prize that it is on offer. So championship is led by the number eight car, which has had a different lineup depending on where you've visited the championship, if you like. So later on uh, in the season, Reno Mastronardi been concentrating more on the ELMS. Uh, the PZ Obera Zurich Say by TFT sport car which is the number two porsche is second in the championship and trailing the leaders by 25 points that number could be crucial later on in the season with uh, two lots of 25 up for grabs plus the point today for pole Absolutely. and the point in portimao as well and then the number nine iron links ferrari too so we've yes we've got a small but perfectly formed field but they are the top three in the championship so there is a reason why we've got the two ferraris and the porsche here key of course now with that uh, quite comfortable but not insurmountable points difference for this number eight car got to finish a no uh, a, a dnf will not do at this point for the number eight car it's a it's a relatively compact season so it's uh, seven races across six venues for the michelin Le Mans cup squad including of course that double header at Le Mans. so the number eight car whilst at the moment has a healthy advantage a dnf would change that well, particularly with just the three cars here, immeasurably. Um, so we'll a bit of a hashtag wait and see as to what occurs today. And then we move to Portimao, and that's a place that really can dole out the dramas. Not like this place can't. Um, it's, uh, but as you can see, Johnny, and, and you've been experiencing it over the last couple of days, after a very wet start to the week, the uh, pre-race weekend test session happened unusually on the Wednesday rather than Thursday here and was streaming wet um, as sadly many race meetings here this year have found weather has been pretty awful for most of the international racing it doesn't look like that's what's going to be happening today or indeed tomorrow for the european le mans series and we get to see these cars in glorious sunshine with colors popping through Lecom corner goes the number eight Ferrari. So Gabriele Lancieri in the number eight. We've got Manuela Gosner in the number nine Iron Lynx Ferrari in the pink and black colours. And uh, Nico Leutwiler driving the number two car. A reminder that it is only bronze rated drivers permitted to take part in this qualifying session. At Le Mans that was slightly different in that you had a, a bronze only session and then the other qualifying session it was entirely up to you. So you got to, we got to experience the pro drivers for once in the year doing a quali session but we're now back to the standard rules uh, and this is one of the usps of this championship is the responsibility that the bronze driver has to take on board lots of track time leading into this session but this is all important to determine where the cars start on the grid massively challenging car uh, ch track and very unforgiving indeed for anything other than a very minor error and uh, it's yeah not quite heart the mouth time for some of these bronze drivers but they'll be relishing racing here but uh, trying desperately hard to squeeze what they can from their car and their talent whilst not risking uh, well we've seen before haven't we many many times here uh, just a little bit of over exuberance and it leaves uh, the car either requiring an awful lot of tender loving care or indeed uh, a quick uh, trip in a bucket back to the garage and uh, into the back of the truck and away they go having missed out the racing weekend none of these three can afford that if this championship fight is to stay open it could be settled here it could um, but right now this is Nicky Lertweiler making uh, doing what he possibly can to stop that from happening and taking the championship fight to the final round. It's 231-844 for Gabriele Lancieri, by the way, in the number eight Iron Lynx car. Here comes uh, Nicky Lutfall. I think he's going to substantially better that. Neat and tidy from Nicky. 
Crosses the line now. It's a 223.377, so very significantly better uh, that mark. So 223.377. And we've been used to, Johnny, whether or not it's the three cars we've got here, five, seven, eight. The, the, the predominant colour throughout these sessions is blue. What do I mean by that is that these are drivers bronze drivers as you quite rightly say that consistently improve their performances through the entire uh, session at the moment i'm looking at a timing screen showing either purple sectors because that was an all purple lap from mickey lutweiler or all blue which means that they're improving on their previous time in every sector that's what we've got used to seeing that's what we expect to see unless there are dramas for the remainder of this session yeah, it's uh, all about trying to go as quick as possible on low fuel. And even though you might think, well, three cars, qualifying session for a two-hour race, does it really matter? I would say that actually experience of a very light car and having to push like crazy will be so useful for these drivers at the end of their stint, which is an hour long, roughly. If the, if the team manager is saying, right, you've got to push hard on the inlap here, these guys need to know what the car's going to do when you've got just dregs in the fuel tank. Still that extra litre, no doubt, that will be taken as the sample at the end by the uh, post-event scrutineers. But otherwise, you know, these cars are running so, so light. What are they, sort of 1250, 1300 kilos? Um, and not a lot more with the fuel. Um, predominantly, these three drivers will be in for the opening stint as well. So they need to know what the car's going to do when it's fully laden as well. Um, and the car, these cars only have to stop once, unlike the LMP3s, where we're still looking at two stops. One somewhere between 55 or 50 minutes and uh, an hour and 10. And then in the final 20 minutes, the LMP3s will have to stop again just for a quick blast of fuel. But what we've seen repeatedly through this season is that teams, when there's any kind of caution period, opt to just switch that strategy it's made it well two things it makes it dramatic it makes it terribly difficult to unpick in the middle part of the race but for me in this uh, still rather bizarre 2021 uh, the Michelin Le Mans Cup has doled out more unexpected dramas than probably any other international race series simply because of the combination of that mixed class uh, mixed class nature of the, of the racing itself and the way the rule book has evolved and those that that, that, uh, that that move to the two fuel stops Johnny has opened up all sorts of other opportunities for the teams to get it right and at times to get it horribly horribly wrong yeah yeah and uh, that's sometimes to do with slightly fluid regulations as well they've changed round to round just very small yep. bits of it in order mainly to close loopholes that teams have spotted and utilized and then the officials have gone okay we need to stamp that out so let's just reword uh, some regulations to enable that but uh, yeah like you say it's been a job to stay on top of not just from our perspective but certainly from the teams on the timing of scoring screens, Nicky Lutweiler has gone through with another all-purple lap. It's a 221.250, but Gabriele Alancieri almost matched his previous time. He's now in the 223s, a 223.5, with Manuel Agostna in the 225 almost dead. So at 3.7 seconds still separate this trio. Um, again, Nicky Lutweiler is going quicker, but I think Gabriele Alancieri is beginning to get the to grips with this session would not be remotely surprised to see him pull some kind of surprise by the end of this what was a 20 minute session at the start Lancieri by the way when we get to the race we'll be sharing with Paolo Roberti uh, amazingly we've had one, two, three, four, five different drivers in the eight car through the course of the year, including Rory Pentanen uh, during the Road to Le Mans events, Logan Sargent has raced with him, and Reno Mastronardi, who's actually scored most of the points for the number eight car. Now, remember how the championship works when ACO Rules Racing is encountered. The car scores points, so car number eight scores points round to round, and then the drivers score sometimes the same sometimes different points yep. um, and it's always a question of keeping up to date with how they're doing because the eight car could very easily win the title with its many different drivers having scored the points uh, well here's the, the the oddity there is that none of the number eight drivers are in the top three in the drivers championship <laughs> Nicky Lertweiler leads that one and leads it from his teammate so the uh, the driver if you like that uh, Nicky Lertweiler's looking back towards in the point standings is actually Dorian Pan in the, this car 
car in the number nine yeah. Lance car. She's on 52 points. He's on 71 points. So it's a not dissimilar position in the drivers' championship uh, to that in the teams' championship, but with different cars. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's always a little tricky to stay kind of you know on the sharp end of who's likely to win from a driver's perspective but more importantly the teams because it will be the team that gets the invitation for next year um, and also trying to work out you know who's been the best points scorer when they've done the races because you might think oh somebody's halfway down the points tally therefore they've not had a good season but if they've only done two of the six races then that's understandably why uh, point six of a second is the margin very good lap again for Lloyd Vila last time through Graham but Lancieri is closing that gap down and uh, uh, notable Johnny we are now f under four minutes from the end of this session I've not seen uh, literally as I say it Manuel Agosta puts in the first sector of this session that is not an improvement that was her final sector to complete her 224.156 Every other sector by all three cars has been an improvement on the previous lap. And that's pretty spectacular stuff. This is a challenging, challenging circuit. And it's always about risk versus reward. You don't want to push like crazy on the first lap, uh, risking a very good time, but also chancing the fact that the car may end up in the wall, be very heavily damaged and potentially won't even race then later on in the day. Qualifying and the race on the same day definitely needs to be taken into account when you are assessing the risks during this short, sharp session. 220.6 for the Porsche of Nicky Leutwiler, the PZ Obera Zurich say Porsche, then the two Ferrari. Ferrari's 0.6 of a second and 3.4 seconds adrift. There's still time to find for Manuela Gosner. I think she's capable of a quicker time than the one she's so far set, the 224.1. Uh, but at the moment, it's about linking up those three sectors all on the same lap. As now, an absolute best through the middle sector for Gabriele Lancieri in the number eight car. So 220.7, just 0.1 of a second away from the Porsche. Told you. <laughs> and here comes uh, Nicky Lutvala through to complete his lap. Is it a further improvement or does that uh, stay the same? It was not an improvement for him either in the second sector. Didn't have an answer to that uh, uh, overall best sector, middle sector of the of the session so far from Lancieri. Could it in the dying moments? Could this, this, this pendulum is swinging in that direction, isn't it? Looking greedily here for what the first sector time is going to be from the Ferrari man. It's a two. It's a 40.585. That's a couple of tenths back from the best of Nicky Lertweiler uh, in the Porsche. But just looking to see what's going on with Nicky Lertweiler's last time. Still uh, registers as a 220.691, but he has crossed the line since then. So we lost timing, we might well have done. Yeah, the clock on our timing is still ticking down, but uh, yeah, possibly the timing is uh, no longer, well, uh, just paused in its updating process. Uh, 0.106 of a second is definitely the gap from first to second. But as you say, the sectors aren't quite being ticked off. Ah, yes, it's refreshed now. So uh, Manuela Gosner blew through all three of her sectors on the previous lap. I wouldn't be surprised if she repeats that feat again because now she's 2.2 uh, seconds away from the fastest time of Lloyd Wheeler. So she's found another second plus in that lap. So she's improving. It's doing what this session is designed to do, not just set the grid, but just give these bronze rank drivers an opportunity to just show what they can do. Where can they squeeze the improvements out of a car in its optimum state. New tyres, low fuel, more or less empty track, and they are delivering. Gabriele Lancieri heading into the final sector now. Again, we haven't yet got a second sector. Now we have. It's better than anybody else it's, wants more. I think this is going to be a pole lap from Lancieri. Well, he's gone blue through the first and purple through the second. Only needs to find a tenth and a bit to leapfrog uh, Niki Leutwiler. And across the line he will go. Our timing is very slightly delayed, frustratingly. He's gone ahead. The eight car is ahead of the two by nearly four tenths of a there second. You go. It's, uh, it looked like that was coming. It looked like he was just measuring his progress through and I don't think Nicky Lertweiler has got time to improve here it's a 220.299 for Gabriele Lancieri that will put Swiss driver Lloyd Vila down to second spot 
and what is Manuel Agosta capable of having gone th blue through the first sector and blue through the second as well. The chequered flag is now being waved so she will see the flag out of the bus stop chicane possibly after again shaving a couple more tenths off the 222.9 that she's currently done. So, yeah, uh, going to be another improvement, I'm sure, from Manuel Agosta. Through she comes to complete the lap, and indeed this will be to complete the session. And shaves another six-tenths off that time. So, excellent stuff for Manuela. It is about improvements, and it's going to be a 222.3. And uh, her car then goes through La Source and immediately down pit lane. So it's the eight car of Gabriele Lancieri with a 220.299, pretty much four tenths of a second faster than Nicky Leutwiler. But neither of those two cars, the Porsche and the Ferrari number eight, have yet seen the checkered flag. And Gabriele Lancieri is even faster through the first sector. Gone purple through that, about to reach the end of the second sector between Campos and Curve Paul Frere. The Porsche is behind the Ferrari yet on the road. So the Porsche lifted off, didn't he, on that previous lap. We've unfortunately not got his lap time there, but is he, is he on a fast lap here as well? It's a 220 points. 691 was his last registered time. It's a 220.299 to Lancieri with a hefty advantage here. But what's going on behind this flying Ferrari? It's more or less matching his previous lap time here, yes. isn't he? Yeah, gained 28 thousandths, lost 22 thousandths in the middle sector. So uh, it is going to be about the same. A 220.299 is potentially beatable. He's going to complete it to cross the line now. It's a 220.349. So he's just five uh, hundredths of a second slower at the judgment. And the Porsche, I'm pretty sure in saying, is still out there on track and set to complete this lap possibly faster or are they all now home is I'd, the question. I have a feeling he'd crossed the line so I think it's done. It's just that we haven't got a letter P next to car mm. number two but if anything I think he wasn't able to match the 220.299 crucially uh, Nicky Lloyd Vila and therefore uh, confirms in second position and a gap of four tenths of a second but when we were staring at a, just a tenth of a second the other way there was a half a second swing effectively in favour of the uh, of the championship leading Ferrari number eight crucially 25 points up ahead well that's now 26 points if uh, the pole position is confirmed it is a little provisional as we speak purely because our timing screen is somewhat glitchy at the moment so we were going by uh, our team TV graphics rather than our timing screen in front of us and uh, yeah 26 points all of a sudden you know if uh, the Porsche isn't able to score this weekend uh, well I suppose it could still get pole in Portimao and a race win here's confirmation of the times two minutes 20.299 for Ferrari number eight and Claudia uh, Lancieri who took that pole position time and Nicky Leutwiler in the PZ Obera Zurich say by TFT Porsche finishing 0.392 of a second slower and Manuela Gosner in the number nine Ferrari two seconds shy but she was getting faster and faster throughout the course of the session so congratulations to Lancieri for that race result, or rather session result, starting from the sharp end, therefore, in, albeit, a three-car field and a two-hour race. There's a lot more to come in this uh, penultimate round of the Michelin Le Mans Cup here at spa Francorchamps. And uh, this place always has the habit of uh, twisting and turning the narrative throughout the course of the day. We'll have a little bit of downtime now before a much busier LMP3 session in a moment or two. Uh, again, for only 15 minutes, so no extension to the time compared to a regular championship round anywhere else. What we do get uh, for ELMS is an amazing extra two minutes for qualifying, uh, which we will deal with immediately after uh, this session has happened. I should say, by the way, we're not going to see a car that we had out in both of the free practice sessions, Johnny, and that was... Uh, really interesting to see. It's the first, or well, the second rather, public outing for the newer version of the H24 hydrogen electric prototype. This is the technology demonstrator with a collaboration between the ACO, um, Drink Green GT, Total Energies and a number of other partners leading towards, well, a new future for prototype racing with the prospect of hydrogen electric powered uh, prototype cars 
battling for the overall win at Le Mans in just a very few years' time. And fair to say, car looked impressive out there. There's time still to find. They're aiming for something like GT3 time. I've got some work to do with that one. But it's very early days for what is a spectacular looking car. It actually sounds good as well. I mean, it sounds very, very different from uh, the normal LMP3 cars. But I kind of quite like the... Um the sort of turbine sounding winding noise that uh, everyone that hasn't yet heard it in person will become used to in the next few years but yes very exciting to have it out actually in a live session uh, but as graham says that won't be happening in the race later today so in a moment or two we will welcome 26 lmp3 cars out onto the spa francochamps circuit and glorious conditions will welcome a variety of cars and teams. Uh, Duquesne and Ligier are the polarised positions for the two chassis. We did have the Ades at Le Mans, uh, but that's not the case here this weekend for the penultimate round of the standard season for a two-hour race. But uh, some interesting names in the second column, which tends to home the more pro drivers, so the silver or the gold. No platinums allowed in this championship. But Rui Aguash returns as a gold to be alongside Crichton Lentudis in the AF Corsa 31 car. We've got Andy Merrick alongside Daniel Schneider. But a big surprise to me, and I think a debut into the championship, is from the USA, Connor Di Filippi. Correct. Joining Frank Kraling uh, as a second Phoenix Racing car. Yeah, it shows a bit of um, intent, doesn't it, from Phoenix Racing. They've had a nibble into LMP3 this year. LMP2 in Asia as well the start of this year we know teams and drivers are looking towards the future in sports car racing and uh, I've got someone at the moment down uh, having a chat I hope with Connor post session to find out just exactly what the plan is but uh, certainly the Phoenix Racing team are looking for that route into the what looks like a bright new future for sports car racing and well, is this another customer that they're looking to take up that ladder? Um, certainly, we were not expected to see that additional Phoenix car. It's great that they're here in Connor, a, a bright star already, a 24-hour race winner at the Nürburgring, and uh, always a contender uh, when pedalling GT cars for BMW, uh, a regular in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship aboard the mighty M8 uh, GTLM car. And uh, we'll be interested to find out whether or not we might be seeing more of him in an LMP car in the near future. Yeah, it's uh, an area that, um, well, he hasn't really visited before. He comes from a downforce background, having done amazing things in Formula Ford in his early days and then moving into other Formula cars, but has become much more recognised as a GT runner, which, of course, do, you know, they are dependent on aerodynamics to a degree, but uh, it's more about the mechanical grip that those cars can produce, whereas these prototypes, the, the baby versions alongside Hypercar and LMP2, the LMP3s still rely on you pushing as hard as possible into the medium and high speed corners to extract the, the lowest lap time out of them, and there are some really fast corners here at Spa. At the start of the lap, Eau Rouge and Radion, uh, and then the, the middle sector is quite tight and technical with Le Combe and Bruxelles, Pouan and Le Fania. but then at the end of the lap it's such high speed as well through Curve Paul Frere and Blanchimont Corner where already this weekend a couple have come a cropper. Well we've got, uh, we're told, a minor delay for this session. Should, should be underway by 12.40. I wonder whether that was involved in the parachutist we just saw. Okay, yeah. Um, so can't see any reason why out on circuit there'd be a delay. There certainly was no incident that we saw out with the GT3 cars, but we did see um, a look to me like a sport parachutist, not any kind of emergency above us. But so uh, whether or not he'd strayed into an area he shouldn't have been. Possibly so. Uh, but uh, we'll wait for confirmation from Eduardo Freitas and Race Control as to exactly what the issue was there. But uh, this one will start, we're now told not 12.40, but 12.35. I think it was that, you know. So um, I'm just interested now to see whether we have lost any time at all 12 35 is the scheduled to start time for this session there you go so uh i say great to see some fans around and i think we're going to start to see some increasing numbers as i was making my way over to the commentary booth johnny great to see some families around mm. and uh with the lms finally able to wheel out um one of its secret weapons in the let's bring families back to motorsports you've seen universal studios 
I have. You've seen, I certainly have, at Disney World. You've yes. not yet seen Rookie Land. Nobody has seen Rookie Land yet, Graham. Well, of it course. was at Le Mans. Oh, OK. It was at Le Mans. So visitors to Le Mans will have experienced and witnessed uh, Rookie Land. It is housed this weekend on the main start-finish straight. It is. Drivers it, left just after the grandstand. Imagine a top international theme park, but with a European Le Mans series sort of feel to it, yeah. and you won't be very far wrong from it. There's no roller coaster, I will say that. There is a giant screen, and there's uh, easily activities there to while away a good hour, I oh, would easy. say. Um, probably, you know, ideally between races today. I think, but, but I think you and I should go and experience it, actually, post-race. Without a doubt. Uh, the tricky thing from the scheduler's point of view is finding a gap of an hour, or even half an hour, between <laughs> sessions today. Because I have to say, what I was, what I was about to say, actually, is that the, spa, the, the fans are really getting value for money. Only they'd not paid anything to get in. That's the great thing as well about the European Le Mans series. To get into the grandstands, the gates are left open for people to wander in and experience ACO rules racing, perhaps for the first time. Oh, trouble for one of the United cars. That's the 23 car. That's in the hands of John Schaumann, and he's had dramas at pit out. How's that happened? Has he got pushed around by somebody else? Because this is the pit lane exit route. Um, from the endurance pits, so the pit uh, stops, the pit bays on the downhill stretch. What's happened here? Oh, no. oh all on his own. Uh, did he hit the barrier? He, if he did, yes. it was just a brush. With the nose, he certainly did, because that bounced him further out into pit lane. Very but odd one. There's a kink there as you leave the pit lane. This is beyond the pit speed limit, uh, but you're still on a very narrow section of track between two white lines, and those that are really pushing catch the grass with their right side tyres, and I just wonder whether that's brought some moisture on, or indeed whether John Schaumann just caught the, the grass there, which has uh, taken a fair soaking midweek. Yep. Uh, although it was nice conditions yesterday and indeed today, and I think set fair for tomorrow as well. One of the less dramatic moments um, of drama at uh, Radion that we've had in the last few months. Well, that's um, well, indeed so, yes. Gets, gets back on track and, and all is well, as they say, as the first of the cars starts on their first flying laps. And amongst the first takers for flying laps, 37 cool racing car in the hands of Antoine Ducat. The 69 cool racing car of Maurice Smith. The Racing Spirit de Le Mans Ligier in the hands of Jacques Wolf, The 11 WTM powered by Phoenix car of Tristan Kratz. And the 5 Phoenix car of Finn Gershitz. And there's some of our high flyers this season in amongst that little lot. This could be quite some session. So Antoine Ducat on the road is out front from sister car Mo Smith. Both for Swiss squad Cool Racing. And they're still building tyre temperature on this... Well, first flying lap, they've done an outlap already, 69, yes, is uh, onto a second lap now. The 37 car, likewise, still finding time to weave briefly from left to right on the Kemmel straight to build a temp into the Michelin tyres. As the title of the championship would indicate, all the runners in this field are on the French rubber. As now through the left-hander at turn nine and down the hill goes Anton Ducat with... Morris Smith just far enough away so as not to be distracted and not to be in the dirty air of the sister car. Finn Gersitz is definitely someone to keep our eye on for the Phoenix Racing Squad. And I don't think Finn has had a birthday since Le Mans, so he'll still be amazingly 16 years old, handing uh, rather sharing with Hamza Ovega. Yeah, born in September, so actually has a birthday in seven days' time. That's Around the, goes the Black Falcon yep, car. It does, that's the number 12 car, and that's in the hands of Mark Rosenberg at the moment. So I think he's managed to gather that back up and is back running. Yeah, and Mark Rosenberg sharing with Dona Munding, two Germans racing for the, uh, well, very well-recognised team in GT3 and also in other GT categories. They run Porsche Cup cars around the Nürburgring, Nordschleife, the Black Falcon, but this is their first season in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. I should say, by the way, in the least surprising and possibly most pointless uh, judgment from race control this season, the outlap of car 23 has been deleted, track limits. Yeah, uh, unsurprising, as you say, um, but uh, there will be a few of those oh, yeah. through the course of the session, and some 
down to mistakes and spins. Oh, speaking of which, very sideways indeed, Finn Guess. It's all over the curve coming out of the bus stop chicane. Amazingly kept it pointing in the right direction. And that happened right in front of Torsten Kratz in the Wokenspiegel team Monschau by Phoenix Car. That car looks wild, doesn't it? it? Does. Certainly that lap is not going to count way, way wide out of the final turn. There's Andrew Van der Kant, who is at the moment the 217.391. Let's take another look. Oh, big power slide off and way wide there. But did the same out of La Source or during La Source too, just the call in the next, very next corner on the road. Absolutely. So is that tyre temperature? Is that Finn Gersic just being a bit too hot in the early stages? Wanting to get a banker lap in as early as possible in a short session, but possibly pushing a bit too hard there. That's John Showman in and back out again after his dramas. We've got the yellow flag at the final turn, so there's been further dramas in the bus stop. Look at Rob Hodes aboard the number 71 Team Verage car. That so car's going to get lost in amongst the curves. It is. It's very, it is very curb <laughs> camouflage, Colors. isn't it? Yes. So track limits might be easy to, or rather uh, difficult to spot uh, for Rob Hodes uh, from a, an official's perspective. They're looking to take advantage of that, I'm sure. So it's Cool Racing 1 and 3 at the moment. The 37 car uh, leads the way from the, the 60. That's the uh, the guesting Phoenix Racing car that we'll see Conor De Filippi later in the race in the hands of Frank Harling at the moment. Mo Smith, third quickest in the 69 Cool Racing car. Then the 25 Spirit uh, Racing Spirit of Ramon car at the moment. And the five cars lap time does count from Fingershit despite the uh, very wide exit to the bus stop. Frank Kreling in the Phoenix racing car. There's actually three Phoenix cars in the race then there because, are. of course, the Wokenspiegel team Monschau uh, machine is powered by Phoenix. They're all, therefore also run out of the same stable. United Autosport set for a busy weekend, but a number of cars entered in this session and the race later as well. And only three more requiring times before we've got... Uh, Legitimate times on the board for all 26 cars. Antoine Ducan, Mo Smith over the line actually to split the cool racing car that is fastest for Ducan and Frank Kraling for Phoenix Racing. A big spin into the bus stop chicane at the end of the lap That's for the Edex. Edex Sport car. Yeah, that's not the required line, I'm afraid. So the 17 car will recover. So Antoine Ducan, uh, 214 951. It's a 215.4 uh, from Finn Gershitz now who goes briefly up to second place but I think he's lost that lap as well so he's now he has lost that earlier lap loses another two so it's Dukan from Torsten Kratz well Alexander Matchell improves so he goes second Jacques Wolf is fourth Frank Carling Tony Wells Michael Jensen that's your top seven at the moment as they change more quickly than I can catch up with and to add insult to injury for Patrice Lafargue who entered the bus stop chicane backwards his lap is deleted it's, it's uh, he, just a tad over track limits maybe there. slightly so yeah. maybe one wheel just cut the, he cut the corner yeah. but he was backwards at the time so I'm not sure he had a great deal of control over that I see where they're coming from <laughs> the officials do have to be you know consistent so still Patrice Lafargue yet to emerge with a, with a legitimate time let's give him another lap he was the car of course involved in that monster crash at Monza in the last two hour race that we had um, what two months ago now should just add by the way to complete that point that uh, with that spin it's uh, Patrice Lafargue too could see where he'd been coming from <laughs> Very good point, yes. So Motorsport 98. The, the tire tracks. <laughs> Indeed. Hans Verick de Donker leads the 37 car, which still leads this session into the 214s from Antoine Dacan. Alexander Machul in the Rinaldi Racing number 66 car runs second. Torsten Kratz at the moment on a very quick lap, though, with a purple first sector for WTM powered by Phoenix number 11 car. Continue that progress through this lap. It's going to challenge for front row and indeed pole at this stage with 26 cars on track. Through Blanchemont comes the cool racing car 37. Yes, it's the Anton Ducat car then, which is already fastest. And the best of the Ligiers of that little gaggle at the sharp end, but two Ducanes up there as well. Alexander Matchell in second, Torsten Kratz is third, so Rinaldi Racing, 66, who are up there in the championship as well, running second. There's now Finn Gersitz in the number five car to the top of everybody, and Torsten Kratz will follow as well into second. So all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, the front row has entirely changed with two young Germans as Gersitz's time is deleted, though. So That's Finn Gersitz 
consecutive lap has been uh, has been has been deleted for, for, for Gersitz. This is very costly indeed for the 16-year-old. He's got the speed. He's got to keep it between the white lines, though, Graham. Indeed, 214.211. Then with this car, the number 11 WTM, the Wackenspiegel Team Manta. Uh, Powered by Phoenix Car, the Duquesne of Torsten Kratz is now uh, three quarters of a second clear of the previous session lead of the cool racing car, number 37 of Antoine Duquesne. Alexander Matchell, uh, third quickest, Jacques Wolf, now fourth in the number 25 racing spirit Le Mans car. Torsten Kratz is going to be very pleased with me because I called him, uh, along with fellow German Finn Gers, it's the two young Germans. In actual fact, Torsten is over three times the age of Finn Gers, <laughs> but we'll just gloss over that because he's matching his speed and the crucial thing is he's staying within the track limits which a 16 year old can't do at the moment young at heart still younger than me Entirely. so there you go uh, but uh, it's another purple sector by the way for Kratz at the uh, the head of this session who I still think is one of the prettiest good looking cars of what is a very pretty looking grid this year so Antoine Ducat, uh, having set the pace early stages, shares the front row with Torsten Kratz. Alex Matchell for Rinaldi Racing in the second of the best Duquesnes. And then five Ligiers tucked in behind for Jacques Wolf and Racing Spirit of Le Mans. Maurice Smith, who was shadowing Antoine Ducat's every move in the opening stages, running in fifth. I think Moe's capable of a better time than that. Auden Goodmanson, sixth place for Team Thor. Oh, wow. That's that a big must improvement. be the best of the, of the season so far, if he stays there. Indeed, and he's been finding time through the season. And uh, for a man that came in being extremely modest about their ambitions, that uh, sort of signals intent, doesn't it? Great stuff from the Icelandic team and the Icelandic driver. And then Eric de Donker in the 98 car with Nielsen Racing and Tony Wells. They're the championship leaders, having had to, that one win during the road to Le Mans. Tony shares with Colin Noble again. They are leading, but only by nine points in the championship. They're currently ninth on the grid. It's a, there's a quick change there for Fingershitz goes to the top. Is four tenths up now on teammates. Torsten Kratz, it's a 2.13.704. Antoine Ducat. Uh, had improved. I think he lost that time, though. Uh, yes, he did. Uh, the 37 car, it was 89 thousandths for just a moment, the gap from first to second. Two things then happened. The second fastest time was deleted, and Fingershitz leapfrogged the pair of them. Now leads this session, finally having hooked up a, a lap with all four wheels on the racing surface. This is the number five car. Fingershitz, the first and, at the moment, only driver into the 213s. 213.704 plays 214.095. Another team that's doing very well, TS Corsa and Pietro Peccianini, the man from Milan, uh, has uh, had a really stellar Formula Renault career in the early 2010s, but then about five years away from motorsport before returning to the Le Mans Cup in 2021. And TS Corsa have not often been in the top 10. Uh, but they're in ninth right now, ahead of the Nielsen racing car for Tony Wells and Rob Hodes just outside the top ten. Patrice Lafargue, by the way, now does have a lap time. It's a 2.28.1 to put him 26th. So, Justin Kratz puts in a purple sector in sector one in pursuit of Fingershitz, who will not improve on this lap. He's already been pinged for uh, track limits uh, at turn seven on the lap he's currently on. So, he's a bit of a kind of standing target here for... Torsten Kratz, who doesn't put in the best middle sector, though, of the session for that or any other car. And we'll wait and see just exactly how much closer, if at all, he can get to the young man, number five, Fingersitz, currently sitting in provisional pole position with under a minute and a half left. And the lap that he's about to start, Torsten Kratz, coming to the end of the lap now through the bus stop, will be his final flyer final attempt the pole position crosses the line now closes the gap gets under 214 it's a 213 832 just over a tenth back from the pole position sitter and if you're wondering why the number five Phoenix racing car was going sl so slowly through Blanchemont, that was Finn Gersitz trying to buy himself some track space before pushing hard one final time. He knew there was only a minute left on the clock. Coming out of the, the bus stop she came will cross the line for the final time. But that was quite, for me, quite a vulnerable place to be slow through yep. Blanchemont on a blind left-hander, the fastest corner on the track. But thankfully, Torsten Kratz was aware of where he was sitting and deliberately went wide and around the outside 
side of the day glow yellow and silver car which now heads along the Kemmel straight Finn Gare sits in a moment or two will produce a sector one time which is not as quick as he's gone already in the session and not as quick as the threat from behind from Torsten Kratz also going quickly at the moment and on Dukan he's just uh, what six tenths off the pole position pace at the moment will be looking to close that down if he possibly can. He's not quite done enough right now, but there's improvements all the way up and down the order. John Schaumann, by the way, is the very first man to see the chequered flag. He'll uh, finish no better than 18th in that 23 car that had trouble at the start of the session. Mark Rosenberg brings home the Black Falcon car, 13th at the moment, with others around him improving. Not sure any of that top three this is where we have to look a little further down the order, though, Johnny. How many times have we been looking at this top three, four, five, and suddenly out of nowhere, yeah. somebody comes in and pops in an absolute blinder? Lap oh. six for car 20 has just been deleted. That's a track limit breach at turn nine. So Auden Goodmanson's position improved because of that, I noticed. So he stays sixth. He's finished his session and with an improvement as well. 2.16.684 for the Icelandic driver, Team Thor. The 77 car will start no lower than sixth, third row start at the moment. Jack Wolf for Racing Spirit of Le Mans, a very good qualifying for them as well. Over the line goes Antoine Ducan, there's no improvement for the Swiss team Cool Racing, so third position and no better for the 37. Also across the line is the sister car for Cool Racing and Torsten Kratz doesn't improve in the WTM Phoenix car. Yeah, Mo Smith did take uh, an improvement, he will start sixth and home to Fingershitz, no improvement there either. So amongst the leading group, it's Mo Smith and Olden Goodmanson that post the improvements. Uh, but the net result of that, Mo Smith up to sixth in the 69 car. Don't think there's going to be any improvement for the last of the leading group to, to finish this session. The 66 Rinaldi Racing car of Alexander Machel still has to cross the line. Tony Wells is still out there and could be a factor moving up the grid, but certainly not to take pole position. It's a pretty good lap from Tony, but uh, doesn't improve. I think he's pitted. He has indeed. He's pitted at the end of that lap. So he was seeing no improvement on his delta. On the ragged edge, Antoine Ducat, as so many were in that session, particularly through Eau Rouge and Radion, and the tyre, the Michelin tyre, flexing beneath the car on that left-hand side. Torsten Kratz finishing in second position with the 213.832 that was set fairly late on, and just over a tenth of a second ahead of everybody, Finn Gersitz. He did push hard towards the end for one more lap time, but it wasn't uh, good enough to improve. It turned out that it didn't need to improve, though the 213.7 was good enough. So cracking stuff again, and some names that weren't that familiar at the start this season becoming far more familiar now and we see what uh, the end of this season and then into 2022 will bring for some of these newcomers from our gentlemen drivers and the new young talents that uh, this championship is breeding too. Their jolly though is the overall order. So the five Phoenix car getting pole position. In fact it's a Phoenix 1-2 and you bear in mind that Wolkenspiegel team Monschau are powered by Phoenix. Cool Racing who set the pace early stages third position for the best of their two cars with Mo Smith in the sister car sixth and between 37 and 69 the 25 for or rather the 66 for Rinaldi Racing and Alexander Matchell and Jacques Wolf for Racing Spirit of Le Mans car number 25. Team Thor, surely a best qualifying of the season for Auden Goodmanson, car 77 ahead of Pietro Peccianini and TS Corsa, also a sparkling qualifying session for them, 73. Nielsen Racing and Tony Wells, championship leaders, will net a ninth place start alongside Eric de Donka at his home race for Motorsport 98, car 98 to start in 10th position. Then United with their best car, the 32, Daniel Schneider, uh, Frank Kraling for Phoenix Race the 60 car the machine he shares with Conor Di Filippi starting 12th ahead of Team Virage for Rob Hode Steve Parrow in the other Rinaldi 55 and 15th place for Black Falcon and Mike Rosenberg no shortage of dramas and happily none of the car damaging variety is all about speed and by the way even though the cars were run out of the endurance pit the 
race itself, the pit stops will take place on the Grand Prix lap, on the, on the level, is my understanding anyway, and that's how it's been done previously. We'll wait and see what happens in reality. You need to join us not only for that, but also we're in store for a cracking race, the penultimate event of the year for the Michelin Le Mans Cup, which is a five to four local start. Join Graham Goodwin and me, Johnny Palmer, for that later.